Okay, thanks for joining us this afternoon. My name is Glodine Brown and I'm the general manager at Kafka. So this year in 2021, Kafka is celebrating its 20th anniversary. The Kafka 21 Biennial is taking place as a series of activations throughout the summer, bringing thought-provoking contemporary art to primarily outdoor public spaces in Waterloo Region. Kafka 21's theme, Everything Not Saved Will Be Lost, invites us to reflect on our everyday practices, our values, and our hopes. It also asks us to think about the things that could and perhaps should be left behind. We're pleased to be presenting this afternoon Caroline St. Laurent and Liliane Moussa's Women Performing Arts and Sports Femme on Performance. Kafka acknowledges that we live and work on the traditional territory of the Adirondack, Neutral, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee peoples. The region of Waterloo is situated on Block 2 of the Haldeman Tract, the land promised to Six Nations, which includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. The Haudenosaunee Confederacy, also known as the Six Nations of the Grand River, were granted this land to enjoy forever as part of the 1784 Haldeman Treaty with the British, after the Six Nations were dispossessed of their land in upstate New York following the American Revolution. The Haldeman Tract was reduced to less than 5% of, of this original territory in the over 200 years since, primarily through the loss of land to encroaching settlers. The Haudenosaunee Great Law emphasizes collective responsibilities and rights, and with this the principle of the dish with one spoon. A treaty extended with the Anishinaabe and the British, which stipulated that the land was to be shared equally, collectively, and with the utmost attention paid to peaceful relations and the conservation of lands for future generations. As an organization composed of individual artists, arts workers, and community members with diverse backgrounds and histories, it is always our responsibility to learn, acknowledge, respect, learn, acknowledge, respect, and uphold the treaties made with Indigenous nations and respect the right to land and life on unceded territories whose traditional caretakers continue to resist colonial violence today. So before we go into the screening, just a quick reminder of our community guidelines. We do have a zero tolerance policy for the use of slurs, offensive language, racism, or any other form of mar marginalization or discrimination. Any violation of these terms will result in the participant being removed from the session. We would like to make sure that this virtual space is welcome to all. Uh, there will be time for a Q&A session at the end um, of this presentation. Uh, so feel free to use the chat and make comments uh, or questions. Now uh, we're going to go into the screening. When we come back, I'll briefly introduce Caroline and Lillianne and then they will um, take it over from there. So please enjoy. Hello everyone, welcome to this performance. We are Liliane and Caroline. Thank you for being here. We want to thank all the athletes who participate to this project. The Kafka team, Egal Action, Maud Turco and Gabriel Fortin Taillon at the camera and Gael Scali at the sound. We are in Montreal, Geojagi, on an indigenous on an indigenous territory that has never been seeded. We are encouraging you to join us in this warm up. Follow the person speaking. Do what you can. Don't push yourself. Engage your body and have fun. Okay, so we're going to start by doing squats. Sport performance is the manner in which sport and physical activity participation is measured. The goal is often to win, to score better than last time, or to improve. Also, 
Sport performance includes discipline, productivity, repetition, money, chance, injury management, adrenaline, endorphin, team spirit, and hopefully enjoyment. Now, performing arts. Performing arts include dance, theater, spoken words, performance action, music, circus. It describes any art form that uses the live body as the main medium. Performance art is a discipline in fine arts. It takes place through actions executed by the artist or other participant. It may be live, documented, spontaneous, or written. In Quebec, we often call it performance. Art action, pour vraiment le situer dans le champ des arts visuels, manoeuvre ou intervention. It includes the notion of time, space, body, and the presence of the artist. The notion of here and now, and the relation between the creator and the public. Now, art and sport performance. The sport is used as a fertile ground to talk about performance code, inequalities, privileges, mostly white privileges, and justice. Uh, it questions the notion of self-care and individual performance in an effort to improve collective awareness and actions. Oh, the physical effort becomes an act of feminist resistance. Vulnerability is our strength. represented in less than 5% of all Canadian written and visual media related to sports. Women represented 23% of board members, 17% of coaches, and 34% of referees, based on data collected by Sports Federation in Quebec between 2018 and Hélène Demers and her team of researchers analyzed three years of language used by sportscasters to describe athletes. Men were mostly called tall, strong, brilliant, brave, and aggressive. Women were called vulnerable, tired, distraught, and frustrated.
we still focus on focused on the appearance of women athletes more than their performance. In photo reports, men are much more often captured in action, while women are in static position and sexualized. <laughs> Sportcasters, mostly men, white men, usually call women athletes by their first name and men athletes by their last name. about the representation of athletes with disabilities in the media. Even Francis Ménard, the director of Tarasport Quebec, couldn't find any, any data and he was really sorry about that. <laughs> women participating to the Olympic Games. Yet, women represent 27% of airtime in the media and men, 73%. There are still inequities in the salaries of men and women I'm going to give the example of Canadian hockey team. They train three hours per day. They have to work two jobs to sustain themselves. They have to clean their equipment while men have their own equip uh, equipment service. They are gold medalists the and they don't even have a league. by various countries in the world, including Canada. One in seven athletes is suffering from sexual assaults or rape before the age of 18. This percentage increase for international level athletes, for athletes who belong to ethnic minorities and non-heterosexual group, groups. In Canada, 59% 59, 59 of girls between the age of 3 and 17 participate in school. Entering adolescence, it drops by 22%. 37% of girls participated in school. Being adult, it drops again by 21%. So 16% of women adults still participate. There are a lot of factors that are doing this, like the lack of time, the lack of motivation, uh, the impression of not being good enough, and comments they receive by the world. L'entraîneur parlait de mon impulsion pitoyable. Il me disait que j'avais un piano sur le 
In a positive way, I was called a bulldozer and a thief cave by my teammates. But I have been told that I'm too tiny for my position. J'ai un corps en V comme les garçons, les hauts larges et presque pas de hanches. Parfois, c'est difficile de s'habiller « girl ». Je recevais des commentaires, des moqueries de la part des autres, car j'étais costaud et plus grande que les autres. Je me suis fait dire que je suis un garçon manqué, car je fais du taekwondo, que c'est bizarre qu'une fille veuille se battre, que je veuille apprendre à me défendre, ne, va, ne leur venait pas l'idée. À un moment donné, j'avais perdu beaucoup de poids et tout le monde me complimentait. C'était tellement plus belle comme ça, alors que j'avais un trouble alimentaire important. La gymnastique au sol était une façon d'exprimer ma force et ma féminité, mais j'ai reçu beaucoup de commentaires négatifs, notamment par d'autres gymnastes. On me disait que j'étais pétasse, et ça, ça m'est arrivé en moi. Des athlètes en crossfit se sont fait demander si elles avaient pris des stéroïdes. Il y en a une qui s'est fait dire sur une appli de rencontre. Malheureusement, je ne suis pas vraiment tirée par les femmes qui ressemblent à des hommes. Tu me ressembles presque. Je, sais, je cherche plutôt une vraie femme. Quand je marche dans un lieu public, je me fais montrer du doigt, je me fais regarder et j'ai même des gens qui me disent en pleine face qu'ils ne veulent pas devenir musclés comme moi. Ça, c'est Michel Le Tendre, que je salue d'ailleurs. Elle dit « Je suis fière d'être une femme et d'avoir ce corps. » Grâce à lui, je fais des choses que je ne croyais pas possibles. Je passe un message de force, de finesse, de détermination et de féminité. Selon moi, ce sont ces valeurs que mon corps transmet. Impression of justice in sport. Athletes are divided by categories, women and men. This is really dynamic. And they are also divided by gender or age. But there are so much more factors that will, that will influence the performance, like the socioeconomic status and the background. There's also the family support, the um, place of birth, even the date of birth for the hockey players, and the skin color. A black woman runner has been banned from the Tokyo Olympics because of her natural level of hormone that is too high. The Olympic organization has banned swim caps specifically designed for natural women, uh, black hair. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> the International Gymnastics Federation have penalized Simone Biles for <laughs> competing skills that were judged too difficult or too dangerous for women gymnastics while men are credited for the same moves
<laughs> Five members, former members of the National Synchronized Swimming Team have come forward to denounce the situation of abuse they have suffered at the hands of the coaching staff and demand damages from the Sports Federation. These athletes still have PTSD, eating disorders, and concussion-related disabilities. In the letter sent to Swimming Canada in 2018, sorry, the swimmers recall an episode where a swimmer began to vomit in the pool overflow gutter. When the coach saw her, she started laughing and she told the other swimmers to keep on going with their training and ignore her. The coach was smiling as if she is proud. She was proud to make an athlete throw up and bring an athlete to this point. We asked mo women athletes what movement they have to repeat to uh, become better. The head stand of Lilian was one of them. And we also decided to experience this one, getting down and up as quick as I can, given, given by a um, rugby player. Researchers estimate that for one NHL player that sustains a concussion, there's at least 4,500 women that suffer from the same injury inflicted by their abusive spouse.
passe mal des limites. Prenons un graphique illustrant le comportement des tissus à, une stress, à un stress ou une contrainte appliquée. Cette contrainte peut être en flexion, compression, traction ou torsion sur le dit tissu, disons un tissu biologique du corps humain. Lorsque la contrainte débute, le tissu se trouve dans une zone de déformation élastique, ce qui signifie que lorsque la contrainte est retirée, le tissu reprend sa forme initiale. Lorsque le, la force de la contrainte augmente, le tissu entre dans une zone de déformation plastique, ce, ce qui signifie que lorsque la contrainte est retirée, la déformation est irréversible. Donc le tissu ne reprend pas sa forme initiale. Si la force de la contrainte continue d'augmenter, le tissu continue de se déformer jusqu'à l'atteinte d'un point de rupture. Caroline is gonna give her 110%. Tan tan ta 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 That was great. Thank you, Caroline and Lillian. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just um, briefly introduce uh, Caroline and Lillian, and then I'll turn it over to them. So Caroline St. Laurent's art and sport hybrid comes from a feminist analysis of the cult of performance. The rules of sport, its various disciplines, its places, its codes, its accessibility are for her, are for her fertile ground to question our high performance society, the inequality of its relationships and the anxiety that results from them. Lillian Moussa is a dance artist and physiotherapist based in Montreal. In her creation, she is interested in analyzing the physical and social impacts of sports events and competitive environments. She questions the notions of individual performance and self-care in an effort to improve collective awareness and actions. So Caroline and Lillian. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Uh, so we're going to be uh, here for uh, an artist talk uh, today for about maybe 20 minutes and then having a Q&A um, period of time of 15 minutes. We have a guest uh, with us today that I would like to introduce. Uh, it's 
and Pegoraro or Pegoraro. <laughs> Uh, hi, Anne. Uh, I'm just gonna introduce. Well, say your bio to uh, introduce you. So uh, I'm gonna read it. <laughs> Anne Pegorero is the Lang Chair in Sport Management at the University of Guelph and a co-director uh, co of E Alliance, the national network for research on gender equity in Canadian sport. Her examines the intersection of digital media and sport with a focus on gender and diversity. So thank you for being with us today. We are uh, very thankful for that. <laughs> and before uh, to ask you some questions, we would like to just continue a little bit more our introduction and maybe show you um, a few works we did together or um, yeah, to more introduce the work. So I'm gonna share my screen again. Um, yeah, I'm gonna share this one to make sure I can see you. Okay, so I just wanted, uh, can I see how to? A second, yeah. Um, so I just wanted to tell you a little more about how uh, Liliane and I met. We first met in the alley uh, because we were living really close and our kids were playing together and we just had, I really had a, a artistic crush uh, into Liliane when I met her. So yeah, our kids were playing together and then we, we started talking about art and realized that we have so much affiliations together. Um, and then we talked about sports. Liliane, uh, she's a former gymnast also. Uh, I practiced gymnastics for, I think, uh, 14 years, but it was in East of Quebec where um, I couldn't do uh, in a really high posi not position, but level of gymnastics because we, I was like in the top of East of Quebec at that time, while uh, Liliane was a gymnast uh, of um, national level. So uh, yeah, really enjoyed talking together for all of that. Mm -hmm. And after um, she helped me with a project that is called um, Relais Papillon. It's a butterfly stroke relay, which I did in 2015 and 2016 at Tangente et uh, Oftea, where I designed um, a device to help uh, swimmers to swim outside the water because I was really interested by um, the um, the butterfly stroke was really impressive movement for me, really strong and, and thing. So I decided to invite a, a synchronized swimmer, a, a, a dance, classical dancer and two um, swimmers to um, experiment this device uh, inside the, outside the water. And Liliane helped me to uh, choreograph a little more the thing. And also something important in that project is that they were talking while they were exhausting. So uh, they were telling what was happening in their body in the, um, in the moment. And they were saying what was different than in the water or then in the air for the, the dancers. So I can just give you, uh, show you like a few seconds of my, my sister though, uh, Tiffany. That was swimming. I was doing the butterfly stroke in the in the device, and yeah, a few pictures of the people that were looking at the five girls. There were five though. Um, she was a Ariane, a, a contemporary dancer. So yeah, that was one of the project that Lilian helped me, and then we did together. I will let Lilian talk a little more about her project which is called uh, Nadia Eskesava. Nadia, are you okay? Uh, yeah, Nadia Eskesava is a choreographic uh, piece that was presented in Tangent in Montreal in November, 2019. And uh, Caroline has, uh, had already worked on um, like leotard that was made of wrapping paper in a previous project. and. Uh, we, I wanted to work with that idea on a choreographic piece. So it's a piece with four dancers, Anne Fleur de Rochambeau, Marine Rixon, Marilyn Daou, and Yann Terrio. And uh, well, the, it's mainly like the first part of the project, like the first 15 minutes where they have like these wrapping papers, leotard, and uh, what was uh, 
like interesting in that is that as soon as they were starting to move the the wrapping paper with with rip is that the word <laughs> i think so so and then yeah it's like it's destroying and then you see the results of the of the the motion so it was a piece talking about a situation of abuse, power abuse, a power relationship in sports, but also in the artistic uh, field. And uh, yeah, it's just like the coach athlete relationship, the competition between uh, the, the artists or the, um, well, the athletes actually. So I, we, and choreographically, I wanted to, put them kind of in a comparison um, situation where we kind of, we had no choice to compare them and no choice as well to see the, to see the mistakes of it in sport, like in sports. It's something that we don't necessarily see in choreographic pieces. We don't necessarily see the mistakes usually. So yeah, anyways, so that was uh, the last project that we worked together. And then uh, Women Performing Arts for Sports was uh, like something that we started from the beginning together. Uh, so this is our collaboration. And now we have Anne with us and we want to um, let you speak a little bit. So maybe uh, we wanted to just start by asking you uh, your first impressions. <laughs> Uh, of the performance you just saw, yeah, in relationship with your work. Okay, first of all, um, you two are amazing. <laughs> that was when I first watched it. They let me have a preview of it. When I first watched it, I was thought, oh, you know, when you invite everybody to come along with you, I thought there's no way that I could do that exercise and talk <laughs> at the same time. So um, that hit me really as a as a real. Um, amazing way to show how hard it is, you know, for women in sport. I mean, it really just brought home that point that you're just, you were, you were exercising and even to get your points across, you know, you had to work so much harder than we normally see male athletes. So my first impression was a real powerful way to make the points that you were making about women in sport. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, what? Uh, the other question is that we can qualify our project at a video or educational um, conference performance. You know, it's not a like, a, anyway, what is performance? Performance is a lot of things, but we also consider it as an, uh, yeah, a conference. Um, and our artistic proposition uses numbers and scientific facts because we consider as a feminist that uh, we realize that we really often have to give numbers to be heard. So we wanted to ask you, what, what do you feel about that also? Because as a researcher, this is also what you're doing. So. Yeah, you know, for a long time around women's sport or women's role in sport, we, we tried to make the case that it was the, you know, the right thing to do, that we should be supporting women in sport. Um, and, and that argument only went so far. And once we started providing data and numbers and hard facts that people couldn't dispute is when I think we're starting to see movement um, inside the sporting world because um, numbers, uh, for the most part, people have a hard time uh, disbelieving them when you can, you know, the numbers that you were sharing, the, the numbers about concussion and, and relation to domestic violence, um, the the lack of media coverage, all of those those numbers that have, we've been able to use over the last little while, I think have made a difference. Yeah, we we think so too. Like it's it's important for us to rely on on that because we soon realize that uh, it's a way to be heard <laughs> to give numbers. Um, yeah, and we yeah. also use parts as a. Um, as a media or as a discipline, because uh, more often uh, more people knows about sports. But when you enter the the art world, it's the same thing. I mean, um, it's almost the same thing. Uh, my sister worked art on um, Marie Claude worked hard on a study uh, in of the, about the place of women in the theater, and all the all the numbers were below uh, thirty percent of women were like writing pieces and presenting pieces of women. You know? So it's really low. Uh, same thing for the Les Réalisatrices Equitables in the cinema. 
they worked hard also on um, stats that they were saying the same. And yeah, so that's why we think we still have to, um, to talk about that. And also, um, you know, uh, Radio Canada uh, for the Olympic Games of Tokyo, they talked about having um, this equal representation of men and women uh, in the in their media, the coverage of athletes, but it is the first year they are doing that. And wanted to ask you, what do you think about that? Are you? Um, what was your level of anticipation? Yeah. Did, did you, yeah. When you heard that? <laughs> yeah. So they first announced that in, um, I want to say, International Women's Day, March 2020. And so we've been waiting to see how it would actually come. Uh, would they actually, you know, meet this 50-50 coverage? So, um, yeah, it's great that we're screening this right after the Olympic Games because this was to be the most gender equal games in terms of participation for women. Um, research out of the United States showed for the first time that NBC gave the majority of coverage to women athletes in the United States versus male athletes. But one of the problems that, that this is confounded a bit with is it's the most time that women had chances to win medals. And so and women were many medals. If you followed the women's team <laughs> in Canada, we won 70 some percent of the medals for Canada women. Uh, and the same happened in some other countries. So they had no choice in some ways to cover it. So in terms of, of that, I think they did a good job. It's what's next. Do they continue yeah. to cover post the Olympic games? Do they continue to cover when women aren't winning as many medals? And I think that will be um, the way that we can judge CBC Radio Canada on their commitment. <laughs> yeah, because I also wanted to point out like the, um, you carried out a research that showed that representation of women in sports increased of, uh, that was increasing of 0.1% per year, but the study was on like 30 years. <laughs> it's not just like a, and then we would see like on the graphs that sometimes it was like really dropping low and then some of the times higher up so like we might have like a little peak there but we just what I realized with that project too is that the the resistance and the fight for that has to be con con like consistent and we have to be constant with it otherwise like yeah we, we, we I felt like we could lose so rapidly <laughs> what we've gained from that so it's just like yeah and also how like the media and the dominant culture is really good to let us know that they're actually making actions and or like uh, yeah trying <laughs> to to make the gender equality happen but at the end as soon as it's over well no one is talking about it anymore and then we don't know what happens so it's just like I don't know like I'm I'm just curious as well to know what's going to happen. Like, yeah, I think, you know, we now have three years to the next Olympics. We've got uh, with summer Olympics, we've got about five, six months to the winter Olympics coming. So we'll see what happens. But, you know, if I if I think about these games and, and hopefully some of the participants here today watch them, um, there's still some things that that I saw that that, you know, make me raise eyebrows. So I don't know if you saw there was an Australian swimmer a woman who won a gold medal and they kept showing her coach, her male coach celebrating her win over because he went way over the top. And it was like, they kept giving more airtime to the coach than the athlete who had actually won the gold medal. And when I think back to your, your piece today, you know, you show the preparation and all the time and effort went into that athlete getting that medal, the, the sheer amount of time she spent in her life to get there and who gets more press, her coach celebrating than her actually in her accomplishment. Um, we saw it with a Canadian track cyclist where there's been repeated showing of her boyfriend who was in track cycling. She won the gold. He had a problem in his race and they keep showing him cheering her on. And I'm like, could we show her performance and her excellence more than we show the significant other in her life? So there's still ways that we have to improve. Um, we want to tell those human interest stories, but we need to think about centering the woman athlete in them as opposed to uh, other aspects of their life. Absolutely. Thank you for, for that. doing all this work. <laughs> and we uh, maybe you wanted to 
end with a before the Q&A uh, period, just like um, with another question. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we've been using a lot of statistics and facts and numbers in the performance, like uh, to nourish what we're doing. And we were uh, wondering how the artistic content of our performance can also nourish maybe your research practice. We mean uh, like metaphors, super Superposition, superposition of talking or uh, like cultural references or things like that and diversion of uh, movements talk about something else yeah. yeah and also like in in that same thing we had a, a thought about also like the, the pleasure <laughs> yeah of what we're doing and for us like finding pleasure in movement and also let this pleasure cohabit with our like indignation How do you yeah because uh, we are often we, we talked about the way that um the effort can be an act of resistance for us but after watching the video we realized that the fun we add together doing that performance it's what it was one of the performance i mostly enjoy doing because i train i'm training with my friends and that fun can be also an act of resistance, of feminist resistance. I think that's that's a really great point because showing also that you can have sport, you can have fun in sport while you were doing it and that while you're putting in the effort, you can still do that. I think that's another message that comes out from uh, from your piece today. And and I, I um, remember I was at an academic conference and if you've ever well, probably been in the classroom, we're very formal in how we present and, and this, um, a uh, woman academic had was re, sort of getting what I would call a lifetime achievement award and she danced. She was a, like, so she danced her sort of speech and people were kind of really taken back. And I thought all these years, I've always remembered her performance of her research um, and it, how it hit home. And so I, I really, um, I really took that from watching um, your piece today, thinking about, is there ways that we could encourage our students as they're doing their research to use performance as a way to make it more real for the audience than what we normally do, which is standing in front of a group of people with a PowerPoint presentation of facts and figures. And so um, you certainly got me thinking about ways that we could incorporate performance, different types of performance into what we do with our research and how we present it. Yeah, we can be our, your if you need body to <laughs> Embody that. Yeah, we can do that. <laughs> that would be great. Also, we, will, we will love that. And we'll also, we were also thinking about, we'd like to do this performance in schools to encourage girls doing sports because why it's important. It's also because, you know, we are such in a stressful world. And to me, uh, it's a way to be healthy uh, in my head, mostly because all of this stress and being a mother and all the, those superposition in my life. Uh, the work I teach and stuff so uh, yeah and also oh yeah the, the another thing I wanted to say was about you know we all often talk about the um, the athletes of uh, Olympic Games and an article of uh, Stephanie she wrote that like two days ago in the press as uh, Stephanie Gammon but it was really good was telling that you know this ideal this idea of perfection of the athletes it's really hard to reach and we want to encourage women and girls just to do sport for fun like and just to go school by bike and walk or you know just because um yeah we don't have to be this athlete this perfection yeah mm -hmm. and this is something like uh, that the art gives me in my life uh it's that i don't have to be perfect and the performance also gives me the chance of the using my vulnerability, which is also really anti-patriarchy, mm -hmm. to use this vulnerability. And once uh, Sylvie Tourangeau, that I think she's probably there today, she's such a great coach of um, performance and a performer, performer too. When she told me like this vulnerability is a strength, uh, it's just changed my life. Like, I would like to say we did some recent research around the impact of the pandemic on girls in yeah. sport and found that one in four girls who currently participate, so we already know that's a very small number, but one in four 
aren't committed to coming back. And I would really encourage if there was a way that you could take your performance into classrooms and into schools and demonstrate this, I think you would bring both the fun and the importance um, back. And it's not like you've said, not the high performance, just being active and joining in. So if there's a way you could make that happen, I think it would really make a difference. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, maybe we could move on and open the conversation to the, the audience. Yeah, and don't hesitate to ask questions to us or to Anne Pegohaho also that is there with us. Okay, it's just some comments from before. Um, I really love that work so much. Thank you. Well done. Uh, bravo. Très intéressant. Uh, that was fantastic. I was really surprised by some of the statistics uh, that were so much more severe and troubling that I, than I had ever expected. Um, some more thank yous in French. Um, one of the things I really enjoyed in the performance was the interactions between the two of you in motion together. I was reminded of how working with others when training or working out can be so supportive and encouraging uh, than doing it alone. I'd love to hear a little bit more about what you touched upon earlier with the experiences you two had when working collaboratively. Mm -hmm. Thank you, good question. I, I, I think that collaborative work is, well, well, to me is essential, like working on, like, especially in art, um, it's, it's, if you're doing arts, and it's not about sharing it with others. I don't know what's the point of, of doing it. <laughs> so there's that collaborative like sharing and then like in doing it and in the process of creation, uh, just having someone there, it's just also like a question of action and reaction. So like you, you have an idea, you're bumping this idea on someone else, the other person answers to that. So it's just like, an organic interaction that I think can just like make the work better or more relevant. Um, I think there's probably also a value or it's valuable to just be working on your own things by yourself. Like for instance, there's a lot of working in the studio on, on your own, especially with the pandemic. But I think that like the sharing your thoughts and sharing what you're doing, even if it could seem not necessarily accessible or mm -hmm. to others it's just uh, it's essential it's just like it's it's just the root of the purpose of of doing art for me mm -hmm. so, and yeah. also to work with someone that also has um traumas or um experience of the same sport is something that we can really relate together yeah, we like we share yeah a lot of things so then it's it's easy to find like a common ground to to discuss and yeah bring the ideas and the the conversation further as well and also just it may be um simple to say but because we are both women also be a uh, woman yes woman and uh mother it's easier it's fun because we can work while our kids are playing together it's important <laughs> to us to say that because you know it's uh especially in a pandemic um, situation it was really hard for me to work on my art project because i'm also a teacher and you know like so and usually i'm i have more help from my mother that comes every time I, and this is such a privilege that i have that if every time I have a project, my mother, she comes from, and my father too, from Rimouski, which is kind of 600 kilometers away. And they just come and they stay a week to help me while I'm doing my production or video or, and it was more difficult because of the pandemic. So um, this was fun to just put the kids together. And, yeah, so collaboration is just everywhere. <laughs> yes. The kids are collaborating to let us work. <laughs> yeah. And, and they, yeah. When they the let us work. With, and yeah, the parents and everybody. Yeah, the partner yeah. also has to be like in front It truly does take a team to kind of get anything done, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Um, I love the paper mache leg. Can you tell me more about the process of like creating that and like why you filled it with candy? I'd love, Just, I'd love to know more it? about that. <laughs> yeah, because this idea, well, that was the Lilian idea. And I really love that idea of doing this papier mache, which I've done with my mother, by the way, when she was there. It was this kind of metaphor of also breaking a leg, which is an expression in English that I still find really funny when you say, hey, break your break leg him. before to perform. And, and also, yeah, all the, because. So, well, actually, we wanted to talk about the expression. Like in, in French, we say a lot, dépasser ses limites, like go beyond, go your, beyond limits. your limits, which is to me completely. <laughs> uh, uh, that, uh, nonsense. It's a it's a nonsense because like if you think of like and this is what I'm explaining in the with my uh, instrument. So it's just like as with anything, if this surpass or we go beyond the limit of this object, it's gonna break. <laughs> so this is what actually we're encouraging people to break themselves in a in a sense. And it's something that we hear in the ads for the Olympics. Uh, we hear like everywhere in schools at work and it's just like a productivity uh, sentence that just is repeated all the time and is encouraged it's just something positive it's like when you're go when you go beyond your limits it's like yay you got it but I think that in my sense and also as a physiotherapist uh, I really have this I'm always in that state of mind of assessing the limit of someone. So like if I have a patient that comes to me, like I have to know where the limit is and make sure that the person doesn't go beyond <laughs> this limit because otherwise it's gonna break or it's just not gonna work. So it's something that is very present in my day-to-day -day life and my, and my work. And we wanted to, like we had a conversation about that. So we just said, okay, let's talk about it. So it was just like, if. We take any tissue or any object or any biological tissue. It's like it's a diagram that exists. I think it's called a young, as a diagram of young, and we that shows like the elastic zone and everything. So it's it's really something that we we learn at school, and it's just yeah. So it's, why are we still encouraging people to go beyond their limits? It's just it's a cultural productivity way of encouraging people to just yeah, not respect their own limits, actually. So I think it was important for us to, to say that. And I was, and also like, we wanted to put, uh, like make and put emphasis, emphasis on the reward that goes with going beyond your limits. So this mm -hmm. is why we put candy in the piñata. So it's just yeah. like, they are <laughs> yeah. gold medal, gold, gold medal to break your leg. And we also yeah. have that, uh, historical like in my uh, imagination in my memories there's that uh, stories of Kerry Strug from the American uh, gymnastics who was who basically did a her last vault uh, with a broken leg and yeah just apparently this is why they they won the gold medal in 1996 at the Atlanta games and this is like a a very important moment because I was still doing gymnastic. It was like something that really shocked me. And it's just, yeah, so this is also Carrie Strike's leg with the medal and yeah. And it's also, yeah, of course we were doing this about the physical, but it's also so mental. Uh, the way that, yeah, it's such an issue for me to put myself limits because I always think I can do everything. I don't know why it's, a, it's not like, yeah, it's just to, to help us give us limits of yeah, time. Just physical. Yeah. yeah, because as women also, we all, we all want to perform in every, um, in every, in every field, field of, of our, our lives. lives. Like and performance we, is, is everywhere. <laughs> yeah, so we really feel that pressure. So it helps us to uh, think about having limits. Yeah, and just yeah. learning how to set your limits. Like as a former gymnast, I personally know now as an adult that they're actually really you learn how to not feel your limits as a, an yes. athlete it's just it's part of your training it's just like there's a limit here but just don't feel it don't have emotion about it don't talk about it just keep on going and then until you don't feel that limit anymore so you just go as a robot <laughs> 
And I know I've trained in the 80s and 90s. It, it, it probably changed. And I hope that the conditions of the athletes and the, the, the spirit is a bit better than it was. But it, this is, I've learned that. And it's not just in gymnastics. It's in, so like just like playing piano or it could be like a, a, anything that you're pushing into performance is kind of a, a yeah. And sometimes personally, I don't feel the tiredness physically. So I, that's why I sometimes deny that I can work a lot. And but then after my brain is just like uh, doing, I don't know, mistakes or whatever, because I don't feel really the la fatigue physique. I have a lot of energy, but then I have to learn uh, how to um, listen this point, the signs to be alert of the signs. So mm -hmm. that was uh, yeah, the whole pinata. And we, did, <laughs> yeah, and we did something more absurd after telling all those really difficult yeah. stats. It was a heavy performance. And then it was like, we needed to do something a bit more joyful and funny. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I love that. That was great. Um, I'll just give the audience a couple minutes here just to gather their thoughts. Um, I have a question for both of you and also for, um, for Anne. Um, so we know that change has to happen, uh, especially systemic change. It has to, it takes a long time and it has to happen like at the top all the way down. So for, for all three of you, like what, um, like how do you see this like going forward and making conditions better for, for women in sport or what kind of suggestions do you have for, you know, starting to make that change happen? Anne, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, so this is what we're funded to do is to try to find what's happening behind the scenes and how we can make change. Um, and we've done some good things in Canada. I would say that, you know, we've we've worked hard to to try to improve the number of women on on boards of sport organizations. But when we peel back some layers, we realize the problems we have. And so once we get past women on boards or CEOs and you actually look at at any sort of intersectionality, all of our gender equity um, work has really privileged white women. And so we do not have representation um, inside of sport organizations at coaching, at administrative levels, at board levels um, for any BIPOC individuals. And that is a real problem when we think about trying to improve participation. Because again, if you can't see yourself there, you won't actually join in. And so we're trying to improve participation at one end, but at the other end, we have this other problem we need to to, uh, to make change. So I think one of the key things for me is that we're able to look at this and provide the data, the, the types of things that Lillian and Carolyn used in their video that will hopefully make decision makers um, have to deal with these issues as opposed to be able to ignore them, which is what they had been doing for a long time. Okay, thank you. And also, uh, I wanted to talk about the lack of the representation of um, athletes with disabilities. Uh, it's something uh, I'm, I'm working on a project since 2019. I'm still waiting to do the shooting a few, in a few weeks with a paracyclist, uh, with Shauna Ryan that has a visual impairment and uh, Joanie Caron that is her um, uh, guide, not guide. Anyway, she, they, they are in, together on a bicycle. And yeah, to me, it's a way to, um, to give their um, plane, plane. Yeah, so they're gonna, they're gonna bike for 50 minutes while they be, will be talking. So there's about also this idea of um, um, talking and yeah, superposition of talking and uh, uh, doing sport together. So they will talk about their experience as a woman and as a woman with a disability. Because yeah, when I ask um, Francis Menard for um, who's the director of Paris Cyclist, uh, of um, Paris Sport Quebec, he couldn't give me any data. So it, and he was so sorry. And he, and, he, and he made some phone calls and he was like, yeah, we need data. And, and for that, we need people that study the data and, you know. Yeah, we, we don't have a lot of representation in the research. We have some starting on, on um, Parasport. One of, the, one of the things you'll see that athletes say, and we're about to watch the Paralympics, if anyone's interested, they start uh, in the 24th, I think, of August, um, is they're often portrayed by media as inspirational versus being an actual athlete, which is what they are. They are athletic yeah. and they um, you know, are competing in a sport. 
And we prefer to sort of other than by saying they're inspirational by overcoming all these things um, that they do to participate in their sport, as opposed to being able to say that they're an athlete first. So that was something I would uh, challenge some of the people here is watch the games and see the athleticism of these individuals as they compete for our country in, in the Paralympics. Does anybody in the audience have any more questions for Caroline, Leanne, or Anne? You can also write to us uh, if you want to be in contact with you with us. Um, if you have any yeah comments, don't be shy. We're here. Okay. Well, it looks like that's it. Um, I want to thank you all for your time this afternoon and for the beautiful video. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us uh, and also for asking um, really great questions. Um, give me one second here. It's important to talk about these subjects. Thank you, Andréane. So it's important to talk about these subjects. Thank you. And. Um, Yes, yeah, so if you would like to join us again, there will be another screening with a different um, different participant joining us on Thursday. Um, so you can share that uh, with your friends. You can visit our website, kafka21.kafka.org to find more information about that and also the programming that we have going on for the rest of this month. So thank you everyone and have a great afternoon. Goodbye. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.